Now that we've discussed the necessary and proper clause, let's turn to the commerce power. Recall our discussion in Unit 1 that one of the major problems with the Articles of Confederation was that states engaged in trade wars using tariffs and other taxes, preventing the growth of a national economy. The problem was directly addressed in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 3 of the 1789 Constitution, which granted Congress the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes. A few moments ago, I described seven broad historical phases of federalism jurisprudence, some relating to federal judicial power, some to civil rights, and some to the commerce power. If we tease out the commerce power federalism issues, we can discern at least three broad phases of Commerce Clause jurisprudence. One, a strong but still limited power prior to the New Deal. Two, a significant expansion during and after the New Deal. And three, a possible contraction as a result of the new federalism. This third phase is really our current historical moment, and it remains to be seen whether and how the Court's changing makeup will influence any kind of new federalism. The New Deal era was a major inflection point for Commerce Clause jurisprudence. If you don't remember from your high school civics history class, the New Deal was President Franklin D. Roosevelt's response to the Great Depression. The Great Depression was a massive economic downturn that started with a stock market crash in 1929. It led to waves of bankruptcies and large-scale unemployment, producing iconic images of financial hardship. FDR was elected to his first term as president in 1932 on a promise to use the federal government's power to revive the economy, to provide a new deal for American workers. Here's a bit of FDR's first inauguration speech when he states the famous line, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. President Hoover, Mr. Chief Justice, my friends, this is a day of national consecration. And I am certain that on this day, my fellow Americans expect that on my induction into the presidency, I will address them with a candor and a decision which the present situation of our people impels. This is preeminently the time to speak the truth and boldly. Nor need we shrink from honestly facing conditions in our country today, this great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive and will prosper. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. In every dark hour of our national life, a leadership of frankness and of vigor has met with that understanding and support of the people themselves, which is essential to victory. And I am convinced that you will again give that support to leadership in these critical days. In such a spirit on my part and on yours, we face our common difficulties. They concern, thank God, only material things. Values have shrunk to fantastic levels. Taxes have risen. Our ability to pay has fallen. Government of all kinds is faced by serious curtailment of income. The means of exchange are frozen in the current of trade. The withered leaves of industrial enterprise lie on every side. Farmers find no market for their produce, and the savings of many years in thousands of families are gone. More important, a host of unemployed citizens face the grim problem of existence, and an equally great number toil with little return. Only a foolish optimist can deny the dark realities of the moment. And yet our distress comes from no failure of substance. We are stricken by no plague of locusts. Compared with the perils which our forefathers conquered because they believed and were not afraid, 
We have still much to be thankful for. Nature still offers her bounty, and human efforts have multiplied it. Plenty is at our doorstep, but a generous use of it languishes in the very sight of the supply. Primarily, this is because the rulers of the exchange of mankind's goods have failed through their own stubbornness and their own incompetence, have admitted their failure and have abdicated. Practices of the unscrupulous money changers stand indicted in the court of public opinion, rejected by the heart and minds of men. True, they have tried, but their efforts have been cast in the pattern of an outworn tradition. Faced by failure of credit, they have proposed only the lending of more money. Stripped of the lure of profit by which to induce our people to follow their false leadership, they have resorted to exhortation, pleading carefully for restored confidence. They only know the rules of a generation of self-seekers. They have no vision, and when there is no vision, the people perish. Yes, the money changers have fled from their high seats in the temple of our civilization. We may now restore that temple to the ancient truth. The measure of that restoration lies in the extent to which we apply social values, more noble than mere monetary profit. Happiness lies not in the mere possession of money. It lies in the joy of achievement, in the thrill of creative effort, the joy, the moral stimulation of work, no longer must be forgotten in the mad chase of evanescent profit. These dark days, my friends, will be worth all they cost us if they teach us that our true destiny is not to be ministered unto, but to minister to ourselves, to our fellow men.